question is, can you hear me? <laughs> meeting instructions. So why don't we have, uh, Jane, why don't you roll that film? Welcome to the Village of Pleasant Prairie's virtual Zoom meeting instructions. Those that registered for the virtual meeting will have a control panel with audio and hand buttons. The icon on the far left is a microphone button that indicates if an attendee is muted or unmuted. Attendees are muted by default and the meeting host may unmute a line for public comment. Attendees can indicate they would like to speak by raising the virtual hand, which is centrally located at the bottom of the screen. Attendees may speak through computer audio or phone call. Computer audio will utilize the computer speakers and microphone. A phone call-in option may also be used by clicking on the audio setting up arrow to switch to phone audio. A pop-up will appear listing a phone number, meeting ID, participant ID, and passcode. Call the number and enter the numbers when advised. To speak during the meeting, phone call is the preferred method. Computer audio may be distorted depending on internet connection or the quality of the attendee's computer microphone. These are the basics of Pleasant Prairie's virtual Zoom meetings. Thank you for joining us today and enjoy the meeting. Thank you. So I'm going to turn the time over to Craig Repke, who's going to start us off, and then um, Dave will share um, some information about the PD, and then I will kind of close out with just um, uh, going doing an overview over the, the financial impact. So, Craig? Nathan, thank you. Uh, good, e good evening, everyone. So over the past several years, the Village Board and the Village staff have evaluated uh, public safety staffing needs. Uh, in 2018, the, the Fire and Rescue Chief presented an internal assessment uh, of the department and the need for additional staffing. This prompted the village to hire McGrath Consulting in 2019 to conduct a third-party review of the Fire and Rescue Department. Then in 2020, the village took a deeper look, dive and reviewed the police and Fire Rescue Department staffing and response policies to determine how best to meet the McGrath recommendations and other public safety needs. Then in spring of 2021, the Village Board hired Mueller Communications, a Milwaukee-based public affairs and communication firm, experienced in working with municipalities for public education and community engagement. That firm helped the Village staff communicate the current challenge and develop potential solutions. These were presented to the Board back in August as a public safety assessment. They then conducted a community survey at the end of last year. And so tonight, we were re reviewing the public safety assessment survey results and, and then discuss the referendum and potential tax impact. Slide.
So it'd be good to review the summary of the presentation to set a kind of set a foundation. Um, the village has identified a need to add additional public safety personnel to the, to the police department and to the fire and rescue department. Uh, the fact is the growing demand for public safety services is not enough uh, and not enough funding for each department to meet those needs. So to better understand the resource necessary and the options to have to make those resources available, we developed an options assessment. The full report uh, is or will be available on the village website and this presentation will walk us through the highlights of that report and also the survey. All right, so just a kind of a uh, background on the, on the fire and rescue department. So as typical, you know, the fire and rescue department provides fire suppression, basic and advanced emergency uh, medical services, EMS, and specialized rescue services to the almost 23,000 residents um, and 494 businesses of the village of Pleasant Prairie. It's also important to note that over the past couple decades, the service call demand has forced the need to migrate from a paid on call volunteer service to a full-time service. The emergency, uh, uh, the emergency response is primarily, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, the response is uh, based on uh, non-emergency activities, which also include, you know, state mandated fire inspections, uh, fire investigations, public education, smoke detector installations, training, which is a huge part of our, our process, vehicle and vehicle and facility maintenance. So right now, the Pleasant Prairie Fire and Rescue Department comprises of 27 full-time employees including uh, one fire chief, two assistant chiefs, and one administrative staff position. So between 2012 and 2020, full-time staffing in the Pleasant Prairie uh, Fire and Rescue Department was fairly stagnant uh, before receiving a modest bump in 2020, and that's depicted by the graph you see on the screen. The staffing levels for the, Pleasant, for the Fire and Rescue Department is just uh, 0.8 employees per square mile of the service area, which uh, by the graph you can see is the lowest staffing to service ratio in the region as compared to similar communities. So just as a reference here uh, for our uh, two stations, we cover approximately 33.3 square miles and uh, totaling uh, just under 34, 34 square miles. So as, as, as most of you, if not all know, the, the current uh, fire station one is just up the road here on 3801 Springbrook Road, and it was actually just recently built in 2015. And, and we typically have three people on duty every day. The second station uh, out uh, uh, County H and uh, Highway C was actually built in, in 1973 and had various uses, um, including uh, the police department, and uh, then later was uh, renovated in 1999, um, which, was, which now is our station two and our administrative offices. Chief, before you move on, can I um, just have you uh, maybe uh, add a little bit of color with regard to, you know, the previous slide, we talked about the service ratios and, and how we have the smallest service ratio. Really that's staffing um, to that, that full 33, um, 3, 33 square mile. Why, why is that important? So even when we look at the, the map, um, why, why is that important? Well, why, why do we raise that as a, as a point of? Well, first off, you know, you know, 33, essentially 34 square miles is, is a large area to cover. And if you look at trying to, as an example, get from station two to station one or Sheridan Road, it takes us at least 10 minutes, if not more, to get there. And, and even utilizing lights and siren. I mean, light, uh, running lights and siren is not an opportunity to disregard traffic patterns and, and traffic. I mean, when we, when we go uh, in an emergent response, we're still responsible to, you know, keep in due regard to traffic. So, and also weather also plays a role as well. So getting from point A to B, and which happens on a, on a fair regular basis where, you know, station two is, is out and then station one has to traverse 
the entire village to get over to the other side. Yeah, so that point of how often might you have, uh, let's say station one is out and then station two has to cover cover the land or vice versa. Station two, has, right. So, <clears throat> and, and, you know, Sheridan Road is, you know, is, is a, is a, a common uh, a common route for car accidents and such. So it's not uncommon for, for example, for Station Two to have to traverse all the way to Sheridan Road. And so, if I'm understanding, part of the reason for the staffing is to make sure that we have sufficient staffing, not only just to cover the current areas, but to be able to, uh, so that Station One is responding to Station One issues and Station Two is responding to Station Two. It shrinks. It shrinks that it shrinks area. It shrinks the response area for, for the respective station. And, you know, and we haven't really even talked about, you know, a multi-unit response. So, for instance, in the case of a, a car accident, which you will, you know, uh, receive a, an ambulance and an engine, um, in, in many cases then, you know, we're de the staff is depleted um, depending upon the, the, the day, you know, uh, with the level of staffing. So one car accident potentially could deplete the entire staff. So just talk a little bit about uh, call volume. So in, in 2010, uh, we responded to about uh, 1,800 calls for service and the response times averaged about, about four minutes and 45 seconds. In 21, we responded to a little over 3,000 calls, so just under 3,100 uh, for calls for service, which is up 83% since 2010. Response times have, have jumped up to about six minutes, nine seconds, so on, on average, and that you know, as we just as we just spoke to, that's a that a lot of that is attributed to having opposite stations, you know, having to traverse, you know, to the other side of the village because of our size. Also, it's important to note that you know, nearly 40% of our calls uh, for service overlap with other calls for service. So essentially, you know, we need to respond to several incidents at once. Um, incident that spread throughout, you know, the 33 square miles. Uh, the demand for fire medics runs thin across the village and reduces our ability to really respond uh, as subsequent calls come in for service. And I just might add that, you know, we're, you know, the, the fire service isn't necessarily a discipline that we can quote unquote stack our calls. So uh, one former chief said it best, um, everything that we respond to is happening now. You know, so I am having a heart attack. My house is on fire. Um, so, you know, we don't have the ability to stack calls. You know, we have to be able to respond, um, you know, immediately. And if we have nobody available, you know, we need to make allowances and have plans in place that, you know, we have mutual aid and, you know, so other responding agencies can uh, meet those demands. Okay. Uh as mentioned, my name is Dave Smithan. I'm chief of the Pleasant Prairie PD, and I've been here for nine years. Um, give a quick overview of our agency. So Pleasant Prairie Police Department is comprised of 36 officers. We are currently staffed at, at 35, doing some hiring as we are normally doing. And we've got officers trained in, in the following areas. So we're a, obviously a full service 24-7 operation. So we have accident investigation, reconstruction, uh, crime scene investigation, physical evidence collection, latent fingerprint identification, arson investigation, death investigation, domestic abuse, sexual assault investigations. We have a police, one police canine at this point. Staff a police honor guard for special occasions. We do police, we have police firearm instructors as well as defense and arrest training instructors and forensic computer analysis, which includes some of the things we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit is the, the time consuming and, and trend that has grown over the last decade of the type of evidence we collect and how the, the time we spend trying to collect this evidence and go through it to get the evidence to either bring a case to trial or to clear somebody on, on some allegations. Uh, the Pleasant Prairie Police Department responds to emergency calls requiring 
a police presence, obviously, and provide services to enhance safety and, and security for the 22,866 residents of the village, covering a total area of 33 square miles. In addition to partnering with other law enforcement agencies in Kenosha County to provide specialized services throughout the county. Those would be, we've got officers that work with the tactical response team from Kenosha County, crowd control team, uh, crisis negotiation team, arson investigation team, and those are part-time jobs. They sometimes are working in a village. Uh, sometimes those assignments take them out. But what that supplies us with is very specialized, capable, professional, highly trained individuals who without those uh, collaborative efforts throughout the county, we wouldn't have that. So it, it's, a, it's also a big draw for us when we do recruiting. Pleasant Prairie Police Department is also the only Kenosha County agency that is fully accredited through the Wisconsin Law Enforcement Accreditation Group, or WILEAG, and is one of just 10% of the departments across the state who hold that level of accreditation. The Village of Pleasant Prairie is budgeted, as I mentioned, for 36 sworn officers, plus 11 non-sworn clerical and dispatch personnel. Dispatch personnel provide emergency 24-7 and non-emergency communications for the police department, the fire department, and public works. Uh, the PD employs three primary patrol shifts daily. That's first, second, and third. Uh, second shift is commanded by a lieutenant of police, while the police captain functions as day shift commander and sergeants take care of supervision on the additional two shifts. In addition, the primary, to the primary three shifts, the department also deploys a canine unit during the hours of peak activity. In addition to patrol, PD has a detective bureau commanded by our operations captain, and our officers are dispatched to a wide variety of situations, including but not limited to crime, theft, motor vehicle accidents, suspicious activities, disturbances, trespassing, alcohol and drug activities, and a growing number of uh, mental health type crises. So the Pleasant Prairie Police Department, as I mentioned, uh, we cover a 33 square mile area. As you can see by the, by the graph, there are some shifts where we have only three officers on duty. That is, now to, to put that in perspective, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of give you an example of that. So you've got, say on third shift, you've got three officers on duty. One of those officers stops a, a, a drunk driver. I think we can all argue that we want impaired drivers off our roads. They cause a danger, a growing danger to the public and to the rest of the citizens in the village itself. Um, one of those officers stops an impaired driver. That's a two-person call. So another officer goes over to pro provide cover and assistance with taking that person into custody. That leaves one officer to handle the entire 33 square mile area. So what we do with that is if we get a big call, say you've got uh, an, a really serious accident that's gonna tie everybody up on the ship, we would backfill that and start calling officers in on overtime. Not efficient. Um, it it takes time away from other activities, more proactive activity, activities. We'd like to spend some of those overtime funds on, but that's where we end up with that. So while the staffing levels are comparatively low and and stagnant, calls for service in Pleasant Prairie have increased over time between 2012. In 2019, the department saw a 7.5% increase from, me from members of the community in need of service. Growth of calls from service from the community does not account for the more than 8,000 additional calls that the officers themselves initiate. That's your traffic stop, start stopping out with a person, finding something suspicious during a neighborhood or business check. Those additional officer initiated calls are critical to ensuring 
the safety of the community, especially in instances when a resident or bystander may not notice something is wrong, like when a garage door is found open at night and include incidents like uh, traffic stops, as we mentioned, that do not require a call from a community me member for us to provide that service. Both the ratio of officers per square mile and the call volume are important factors to consider when determining staffing needs. However, the amount of time officers spend responding to calls and the time required to fulfill the department's other responsibilities must also be taken into account. For example, in recent years, Pleasant Prairie Police Department, like agencies across the state and across the nation, have responded to a growing number of drug overdose cases. And on a more regular basis, an increase in burglaries and thefts in the area, also tied to the opioid epidemic, as many drug users resort to these crimes to pay for their drugs. The complexity of those in incidents requires officers to spend more time on the scene and inhibits their ability to spend more time in self-initiated activity, such as patrolling neighborhoods, patrolling business. Um, as an example of that, we have two officers, we've got a detective and an officer now who dedicate uh, a vast majority of their time downloading telephones. So as, as a quick case look, you come across an overdose, you're gonna take that individual's phone, you're gonna have to write a subpoena for it, and then once that search warrant, once you obtain that search warrant, you're gonna be able to use our uh, really highly technical uh, equipment to download that phone. So you're gonna to hope to get evidence of where that person may have purchased their drugs. As you know, everybody works on phones now. So that's, that's what I talk about when I talk about the, the growing technology that forces us to kind of change the way we were doing things. In the old days, in my old days, we would have been like knocking on doors, talking to people. Now we're not just knocking on doors, but because of our community camera partnership, which we started some um, additional operations with this like ring doorbells, we are able to capture and have citizens voluntarily come forward and register their devices with us. We don't look at them, we can't see them, but at least we know when something happens where we can go proactively to try to find some evidence as opposed to the old knocking on every door. Now we've got maybe four or five cameras in a neighborhood we can proactively go look at, but that also includes now the time of going through that device, having it downloaded, being able to go through that video much like we did with uh, the hundreds of hours we spent on the Cheddar's homicide. Going through all that video from all those stores out there, just trying to track down one vehicle and two suspects. And it was, and it was absolutely critical to the outcome of that case. And, you know, Chief Repke brings up another one, the, the, the North Base. Um, having that video, was critical in us getting the help from Chicago PD gang unit to take nine of those individuals into custody and follow file charges against all 10. So it, it, but that is all additional work that 10, 15 years ago, we really didn't have. So Chief, can I just sure. jump in here just to make sure, basically what you're saying is technology is kind of, it's a hidden blessing and a curse, right? Um, in the sense that 10 years ago, you didn't have this evidence to help right. you process and help you be able to, to firm up a case. Sure. But, but likewise, now that you do have it, you can't just ignore it. No, we, it, 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 it is, don't get me wrong. It, I, I love the surveillance doorbells. I, I love our body cameras. I love stores having really good digital footage of what's going on inside their stores, that really aids us in bringing these cases forward and having a successful case be prosecuted. So, but the time is now put into that that we can't ignore. So these cases 
from the officer standpoint i've got an officer who handled a case today between neighbors normally that would be we take their side we take this side we don't have any other proof but one of the neighbors had a cell phone and had video well they weren't quite sure how to get it off their device so now the officer's got to go back tomorrow pick up that device get that information downloaded so we can take a look at it um those are the types of cases that are extending the officer's time on scene and on calls to be able to handle it completely. And that's what you're expecting. You expect us to be able to, like our mission statement, be professional, competent, and compassionate. Professional and competent are two of those big things that, that we are spending a great deal of time on to make sure we succeed in that. Perfect. So if we were to go to the, the next slide, we can kind of just go through a bit of demographics and, and uh, both chiefs feel free to jump in at all. But and just uh, to kind of give you uh, history over time, you can see the slide 2010. Um, since 2010, we've grown in population by just over 3,000. That's a 16% growth. Um, which has put a strain on public services, and, and we anticipate that our growth will continue. Um, so basically what was identified as a community need uh, is that as the population continues to grow and develop, mint continues to increase. The demand on village public safety services has also increased. Included with the 62% increase, or sorry, 83% uh, increase in calls for fire and rescue uh, since 2021, um, uh, as well as just the continued demands on the police department um, and the complexity of the calls, um, we have kind of a fundamental challenge. So if you go to the next slide, uh, there are three things that, that uh, have been identified. Um, department leaders, village staff, and external experts, including McGrath Consulting Group, have assessed the needs of Pleasant Prairie and concluded the following measures are necessary in order to bring public safety capabilities up to the appropriate levels as compared to demand size, makeup, and population of the community, which are hiring 12 additional fire medics, um, adding a third fire station, and then hiring four additional police officers. Now, I'd know that the fire station is not what's on the referendum or on the ballot. Um, we're only talking about personnel. But part of the thing is, is that it doesn't do us any good to build a fire station that we don't, we can't have men to staff it, right? And so the McGrath study, you know, identified that we need a third station in order to make sure that those, um, that area, we can shrink the response times down. Um, but we won't, we won't even be able to get there if we don't have the manpower in order to, to staff it. Um, so these things, uh, basically bolstering public safety department in this way would require an additional 1.6 million uh, in village safety budget to fund each additional staff member. And really that's the critical thing. A fire station's a one-time cost, one and done. Once you have it, it's there but it's the, it's the personnel that you have to pay for every single year. And that's not something that, you know, with, uh, hey, we got a, a, a remaining portion fund balance this year, uh, now we can buy, buy men, right? Because we have to, we'll have to pay for them in the future, if that makes sense. So with that, uh, we basically, uh, the public safety ass assessment identified four potential solutions to ad address the challenge. The first is, is very simple, do nothing. Uh, maintain status quo. Maintaining status quo would likely compound current stressors on Pleasant Prairie public safety services in the years to come as population and development trends continue. Uh, maintaining the status quo would likely increase our response times. Uh, and granted, over time, we've kind of maintained status quo. We've made incremental adjustments trying to um, uh, adjust and, and add fire personnel and also police personnel as we've gone along. But clearly, we haven't been able to keep up um, completely. Uh, the second is to apply budget cuts uh, and service reductions to other departments in order to shift resources to public safety. 
the only real areas to cut services and free up tax revenue uh, was in streets and parks. Uh, and this is an important point. Other departments are primarily funded uh, by charges for services. So a lot of the other services that we provide, like um, community development, building inspection, things of that nature, those are primarily paid for via fees. Uh, it, isn't, um, it isn't property taxes that go towards supporting those, those services. So a uh, majority of our property taxes go towards public safety, and then the remaining goes towards um, the streets and parks. And so the, the thought process in order to shift, we would have to cut or reduce, um, reduce those services and shift it over to um, public safety. The third was to identify additional revenue sources, which can be broken into three categories and will be covered in the next slide. The fourth was to partner with surrounding communities. This option is somewhat limited. Uh, the village already partners to a significant degree with surrounding communities in forms of mutual aid. The next tier of partnership would be a consolidation of services, which would limit local control and in past has been unfavorably looked upon. So uh, in other words, you know, instead of us having our own police department, we consolidate services, we have the sheriff's department take care of policing services within Pleasant Prairie. Or we work with uh, Kenosha Fire and Rescue and we consolidate, we have them run our fire and rescue. Um, and basically in the past that hasn't been favorably looked upon, but you know, that is an option that's, that's out there. I was just going to mention uh, the comment about uh, mutual aid. So, you know, for, <clears throat> for decades, you know, the, the fire service and Pleasant Prairie Fire Department, you know, has, has engaged in, in partnerships. Um, there's an organization uh, referred to as MABIS or the mutual aid box alarm system, which is typically used for larger incidents, you know, uh, larger fires. But uh, as part of that, you know, we work with our mutual aid partners, you know, whether they're across the border, Winter Harbor, Zion, uh, Beach Park, Newport, Bristol, Salem, Summers, and the city of Kenosha. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, mutual aid was never intended to satisfy everyday call volume, okay? So, you know, so what do I mean by that? Is that when you know we have overlapping calls that we mentioned with that I mentioned earlier, um, you know when we have no resources available, we would typically call for a fire truck or an ambulance from a from a neighboring community. Now the challenge with that is that you know we're we're at a significant disadvantage, especially from the east, right? <laughs> you know we can't go east for any for any help because um, there's the lake. Yeah, if it, if that wasn't we'll obvious. Get wet. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, and, and even even from the West, you know, as much as, you know, we do work with, you know, Bristol and, and even Summers and in the city of Kenosha, um, you know, that increases our time. You know, if, if, if any of you are familiar with, uh, you know, the Bristol and where they're located, um, you know, marvelous folks, we do great things with them, but they're a long ways. And, you know, if they need to come from, you know, their, their location and go to, you know, uh, H and 31. That's that's a that's a that's a trip. Um, we utilize uh, Winter Harbor um, and our and our friends to the south. Um, you know, fortunately for us, you know, we we operate as if there are no borders, and so that really has helped us out. And 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 of course, the city of Kenosha, we utilize them as well, as they have, you know, I don't want to say more resources, but they have more resources. You know, even though that they're very busy as well. So I just wanted to make a note about mutual aid, you know, as far as one of the options. Um, we've utilized mutual aid. Um, I've been here 39 years now, and uh, we've, from, from the day I've been here in, in, since 1982, we've always utilized mutual aid in some extent. So just wanted to comment on that. Yeah, thank you, Chief. So with option three, basically there were three subcategories or, or items that staff identified as additional sources of revenue. And so um, they're pretty basic, basically um, the referendum. Um, so approval by voters through a referendum to exceed the state imposed property tax levy limits. Um, the second option was a village wide wheel tax on vehicles registered in Pleasant Prairie. Um, and then the third was to increase utility service charges for village infrastructure, which would then allow us to shift those resources to 
that we would be spending on, on public infrastructure to, to public safety. So with all those options, that, that those four assessments, we then took and, and um, presented a survey to the general public. Um, the village conducted a community-wide survey to determine residents' preferences for addressing public safety challenges. Village contracted with Community Perceptions in October of 2021 to conduct a community-wide survey. Community Perceptions mailed the paper survey to all residences within the village of Pleasant Prairie, over 8,500, as well as offered an online option through a unique survey access code, so no one would be able to duplicate, <laughs> if that makes sense. The survey closed late November in 2021. The total survey responses were um, 2,145. That was a response rate of 25%. Those results were presented to the board in December. Those participating in the survey reflected an older population and consistent with those who have a tendency to vote during, the, during an election. And I'll review now with you the highlights. <clears throat> so uh, first, this idea of maintain status quo, the first question that was asked um, was, well, in response to the first option of maintaining status quo or doing nothing, community perceptions felt a fair way to assess this option was to gauge how important it was to maintain public safety service levels. Um, if it was important to the public to maintain service levels, then the obvious conclusion would be that resources would need to match that growth. Um, in the survey, 89% of respondents said that maintaining the current level of emergency services is important to them and their families. So either that somewhat or that extremely important. Uh, with regard to budget cuts and service level reductions, 62% opposed, uh, which would also lead to the conclusion that the village explore additional funding sources to maintain the current level of fire and rescue and police services rather than reducing services to balance the budget. So the survey revealed that while the respondents were not in favor of the utility surcharge and the wheel tax, a majority of respondents did support a referendum to increase the local property tax to fund public safety. This opinion was shared equally among all age groups and categories. So it wasn't like it wasn't weighted where one group felt more strongly than another. It was pretty consistent that that 55% in support was pretty consistent across all demographics. So consistent with the public safety assessment, the survey results before the board, um, we presented before the board a resolution 22-02 uh, to authorize a referendum to be placed on the April ballot asking voters whether to, whether to increase the levy by 1.6 million to fund 12 additional fire medics and four additional police officers. Uh, and here's the referendum question. Um, we don't have a lot of liberty with how the question is phrased. The state statute requires us to phrase it very specifically. Um, and so I'll just read the, the verbatim. I don't expect you to uh, you know, memorize it. Um, hopefully it's understandable, um, but I know that it's long, but I'll read it in general. So under state law, the increase in the levy of the village of Pleasant Prairie for the tax to be imposed for the next fiscal year 2023 is limited to 2.57%, which results in a levy of $14,619,727. Shall the village of Pleasant Prairie be allowed to exceed this limit and increase the levy for the next fiscal year 2023? for the purpose of hiring and retaining additional sworn police officers and fire and rescue personnel by a total of 10.94%, which results in a levy of $16,219,127 on an ongoing basis, include the increase of a 1.6 million for each fiscal year going forward. So what does that mean? Um, basically, a majority yes vote would allow the village to increase the annual tax levy by $1.6 million to cover for the hiring and retaining of four additional police officers and 12 additional fire, uh, fire and rescue staff beginning in 2023. 
a majority no vote um, or failure to pass the public safety referendum would result in Pleasant Prairie maintaining status quo. Um, over time, if the village does not identify funding to hire additional fire and police personnel, the existing challenges will create more strain on the departments as we've, as we've explained. Maintaining status quo would likely compound the current stressors on Pleasant Prairie's public safety services in the years to come as population and development trends continue to increase. Um, maintaining status quo would also likely increase response times. If the village does not identify new funding sources, and mu it must keep staffing levels the same as they are today, there will be an impact on the quality of public safety services provided, including increased response times and further strains on public safety personnel. So there was a question that was brought up earlier today that I think is important, and, and before going into this slide, that 10% that is somewhat um, elusive, right? Um, because 10% just seems very dramatic. And when you look at your property tax bill, it's important to note that your property tax bill doesn't just represent the taxes that are collected for the bill, village. So as you can see in here, um, your tax bill, if you're, you know, the general um, assessed value is, you know, about right now $17 per, per, per thousand. Um, we're only, we only represent about 22% of that bill. So of the $17, 22%, okay, um, the $4 and 11, $4 and 60, I can't read it from here, 69 cents currently um, is, is projected to change to $5 and 11 cents, right? Um, but in the overall picture, uh, you know, from a, a if you were to take that increase on a percentage base, it's not 10% uh, on the total, right? The, the total um, amount that you, you pay taxes. Um, so the mill rate um, for taxes would increase to the $5.11. It'd be $42 per 100,000 um, of assessed value. Um, the chart above um, provides the historical trend in context of all taxing jurisdictions. It assumes that all other taxing jurisdictions maintain their current mill rate um, for 2023. But you can even see that, you know, we're not even projecting to exceed what was in the past, right? Like in uh, 20, 2019, 2018, it was higher than, than what it would be even currently in, in 2022, 2023. Um, another question that we get asked a lot is, why doesn't the commercial, the business district, pay more and contribute more? Um, I'm going to go through this graph and this slide, but hopefully that answers this question, because generally speaking, by having it on the taxes, they will. If we were to put it on, you know, remember those other two options of, of the uh, will tax or the, um, the utility, the utility bill, um, commercial, commercial still pay utility bills, so they would have um, some, some skin in the game there. Um, but generally speaking, property tax distributes that across the both residential and commercial. And um, often it gets said, well, those commercial, they get all these tax breaks and they get all this money, and, and it, that's uh, kind of a little bit of, uh, that's an elusive argument too, but let me read the slide first and then we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit. The question is asked, why doesn't the business community share more, more of the burden? The chart displayed is created with data compiled by a third party. This is not Village of Pleasant Prairie data. Um, a group called the Tax Policy Forum. The chart compares the property tax per capita of Pleasant Prairie to other municipalities. This includes both municipalities in our region as well as Wisconsin communities that share a similar population. So um, entities like Stevens Point or Nina, Wisconsin, I think are, are, are in here. Um, but it also includes Kenosha and Summers and, and South Milwaukee and, and Oak Creek. So all, of the, all of the, the villages and communities, municipalities that are in our region as well as some comparables across the state. 
Um, when we split up the per capita cost by a burden share between residential and commercial, we learn that Pleasant Prairie, so, oh, I should first say, among our peers, we rank one of the lowest property tax per capita. And in fact, when you look at our taxes just in general, you know, we pay less taxes than Kenosha. You know, we pay less taxes than many of our counterparts in the surrounding area, okay? But when we even distribute it across per capita, we divide it out by Per, on a per person basis, we're one of the lowest um, amongst all our counterparts. And then when you add in the burden, you share the share cost burden, commercial versus residential, well, <clears throat> we learned that Pleasant Prairie has the lowest property tax per capita of residential burden among its peers. So in the graph, the green represents the commercial burden and the blue represents the residential burden, and the gold, that represents Pleasant Prairie's residential burden. So because of the well-thought-out planning um, that this village has always prided itself on and the recruitment and attraction of businesses, a lot of your tax burden, is, the 50%, is, is proportioned out to the business community. Okay. So... Um, in other communities, they don't have that luxury, right? They don't have the commercial that, that's required. So when we talk about like tax incentives and things of that nature, usually what the money is going towards, it's going towards public infrastructure. It's going towards the payment of putting in roads and, and water utilities and sewer utilities, um, stuff that normally um, some, in some communities they expect the taxpayers to pay for. Well, we do a very aggressive job of fighting and arguing, no, uh, business community, you're going to pay for it. And if we can, we will use some, some TIDs um, to help um, shoulder some of that burden. Um, and what basically happens is uh, taxes that uh, would be collected by the county and the school district, proportion of those taxes basically get um, uh, earmarked and directed towards infrastructure. But that benefits us too as residents because we're not necessarily paying for it. That makes sense. Just a few more slides to kind of walk through um, regarding kind of this, this per capita. So the tax policy forum also provides per capita spending on specific governmental services. I think this is important and powerful too to note that Pleasant Prairie has been very fiscally responsible uh, we're not paying the most, we're not paying the least, but we're trying to be responsible to the citizens that we have. So the village currently spends about $183 per capita on fire and rescue. Based on an additional $1.2 million in personnel, this will rise by approximately $60. We won't be the largest, but we, it's, we're not going to be out of sync, but we're, it's definitely going to be a boost and going to be making sure that we're um, directing it towards our per capita. And also I would add that we won't see this jump for, for, for a significant period of time too because we'll have that station three. Um, on the police side, the village currently spends about 210 per capita um, in police. Based on the additional 400,000 in personnel, this would rise by approximately $20. So again, we'd be we're in the middle of the pack right now, uh, and we would we would still be in the middle of the pack even with that increase. Um, the one outlier in that is Summers, and part of that is the Summers contracts out their their services to the sheriff. They have the sheriff covering them, and last I heard, they're they're complaining because they don't have enough coverage. So basically, uh, currently the next steps. Um, uh, well, we passed the resolution, we've continued public education, we've held our public information meetings on the 23rd and on the 16th, and uh, the next step will be conduct an election on April 5th. Um, and that concludes our presentation. I'm sure there will be questions or there are questions in the audience, and so we'll entertain those and, and hopefully we can answer them as best as possible. Any questions? I just have a question on 
in the paper and that you guys said that that TID number two is all done this year. So how much additional revenue is that going to bring in the Pleasant Prairie? That is a great question. So yeah, let's let's talk about that because I didn't cover that. I covered that in the last the last meeting and I should have covered it now. So with TID two closing, what ends up happening is, is you have tax relief. So state statute requires um, a good portion of that to TID to basically um, go back to tax relief. So for instance, the school districts and the county, or not the county, but the school districts and the, um, the tech colleges and so forth, all of their funds basically go back to tax relief. The village's portion, 50% has to go back to tax relief. So when we actually consider it, um, generally speaking, that TID2 is probably going to make this referendum um, be negligible, meaning it will probably dissolve the complete total amount. We tell people we want to be upfront, and so full disclosure, we don't like to overpromise and underdeliver. We prefer to uh, uh, underpromise and then overdeliver, right? I needed to make sure I said that correctly. Um, and so we tell people up front that it's going to be that $42 per, per 100000 but um, it's a little early for us to actually do the calculation because we don't know what the, what's going to happen with the county. We don't know exactly what's going to happen with the school district. But just in general with the village, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that you're going to see that $42 is going to be basically zeroed out by that TID2. So that's a benefit. We don't talk about it. Um, uh, we probably should pat ourselves on the back and promote that more. Um, but in all honesty, we feel like the referendum should stand on its legs as is. Um, and so we're hoping that everybody wakes up tax, tax morning and they're like, whoa. But um, hopefully I answered your question. Yep. Thank you. Other questions out there? When, uh, when we're short staffed with the police, like on third shift, when there's a call and we only have the officers? Yes. Yeah, correct. What what role does the sheriff's department have in help? It, when asked, the sheriff's department will come in and, and help us respond to calls. They've done it. Uh, we also, we've helped out the city of Kenosha on third shift when they've had their major incidents happening. So without calling it mutual aid, we still have that. And the county does help out in, in our jurisdiction as well. It's just not a planned out event. So even, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the staffing from the Sheriff's Department is for the village, if they staff a vehicle here or not. I think they have a number of vehicles east and a number of vehicles west. So their, whatever their staffing is at that point, they can help out as is. We also received some help on uh, some major incidents from the state patrol. So we work very closely and collaboratively with these agencies around here, but it's nothing we can plan out. So if, if, I, have, if I have those additional officers on those shifts, if it's third shift, I can plan out for some proactive activity. You know, if we're if we're experiencing some vehicle, some theft from vehicles in a certain area, I can take an officer, put them out in a plane squad, and have them look for that activity. If I'm down to three three officers on that shift, I can't do that. So that now, you you pay me to run a police department, and I I use my training and experience to be able to do that. Now I can look at and say, okay, is that an important enough uh, trend? that I call somebody in on overtime and try to address that, that situation that way? Or do I wait until we've got enough officers on that shift to be able to handle it? So the efficient way is having those officers staffed on a regular basis. Uh, I thought the Kenosha County Sheriff's Department had an obligation to help us out. They do, I mean, you know, because we are in Kenosha County as well. Um, they also are in areas that don't have any other law enforcement. So they've got Summers, they've got Bristol, they've got um, uh, some of the Lake, Paddock Lake, those other areas out to the west that don't have any other law enforcement. So they are the only law enforcement out there. 
Yeah, and I don't, uh, you know, there's the sim similarities between, you know, law enforcement and, and fire, you know, the, the challenge becomes if, you know, you, if you're looking for a sheriff's deputy, they may be on the, you know, on, on the far side of Bristol, you know, and so they're, you know, they're not as, you know, as, as available as you one might think. I mean, we always ask the question, it's always interesting, you know, how many, how many squad cars do you think are patrolling your, your area? And a lot of folks will answer much more than what actually is. And uh, so on a, on a similar, you know, like for fire, you know, if, if we need a, if we had an incident 116th in Sheridan, my assumption is let's get the closest mutual aid would be Winter Harbor, you know, everybody's becoming busier. So, you know, the Harbor may take a pass. Now I have to get what's my next closest and are they available? You know, and so what happens is that we, we always fight this. We always fight the clock and, uh, you know, we can't, we can't roll that back. And, you know, our dispatchers, you know, um, have been excellent in, in figuring that out. And so there we've trained with them to the point to where they're anticipating the next move. It's kind of like chess, right? So they're anticipating the next move. If I can't get the harbor, do I get Zion? If I can't get Zion, do I get Newport? And so, you know, that's all clicking in their head. So um, it's, it's kind of a, because everybody's getting busier. And that the example you, you gave about the Sheriff's Department being in the area and helping out, just want to reiterate, they, they do that on those, on those major incidents. If we need some help, if one, of our, if one of our officers is going, the situation I gave where we have two officers tied up, maybe at the at Freighter ER with a mental health case, and we've got one officer alone, I'm not, I don't want to leave you with the idea that we don't have any other possibility of having that officer go to a call with somebody else. It is possible. It's not efficient. So it, the other impact of that is when you aren't staffed properly and you're expecting another jurisdiction to come in and, and try to help you, they will for those big calls, but that's not going to be an answer for you doing proactive work. So we're not going to have the Sheriff's Department coming in, responding to calls for service for our residents, so we can do some proactive work like traffic enforcement, which is huge. You know, we had, uh, a, just as an, a, a, as an example of that, we had periods last year where our pursuits were up five, six hundred percent. And, and that is in those years of, of uh, civil disruption and other problems going on and, and crimes rising. So it, when you talk about how important it is for officers to be on the streets and watching things that may, be, may seem kind of benign, like traffic enforcement, it really impacts the traffic safety and the safety of our citizens as well. So Wayne, we'll we'll get to you guys. I promise. Wayne Kessel had his hand up first, and then and then. Can I ask multiple questions? I have some friends that could not make it tonight. Sure. Yes. One is, we furnish police officers to the elementary schools. Yes, we do, but that's on the Kenosha Unified School District pays for that, so they. They do that. We have a school resource officer for the three elementary schools and the, the current high school, and we get money from Kenosha Unified School District to cover that spot. And the other question is, is there a ne negative impact on funds from the RecPlex? Um, like because of because of the referendum or in general? Are you talking with uh, with COVID? So. Yeah, so we had we had um, addressed this with with COVID nineteen. There there had been a, a significant impact. Our our um, our recplex operations had been closed for like three months, and because of that three month closure, it, it impacted the recplex um, revenues and operations. Um, in the that year, we um, in order to cover the interest payment for um, for their debt service, um, the the general um, the property tax uh, assisted or supplemented um, uh, five hundred thousand dollars for for the recplex. Um, the referendum is not going to have a negative impact or or 
um, be responsible for um, um, for this. But that that point of having the RecPlex um, serviced by um, our property taxes was partly because we had a general obligation to do it. It, it was backed by the, the taxpayers, and um, we um, have been very fortunate. The RecPlex has been um, doing very well, and so we're, we're hopeful that we're going to be able to, um, that that's a blip in the road, if you will. Um, so hopefully I answered your question, Wayne. Thank you. One more question. New fire station. How many men will that require? So typically we do a minimum of three. Okay, so at any one station, there's at least three individuals. Now, you know, as, as the staffing allows, you know, there's some days that we can do, we can do, you know, five or six, you know, and that allows us to get multiple units out, um, you know, from the one station. So as, as Nathan spoke er way earlier, we talked about being, you know, station two being able to handle station two's calls. And so with a station three, you know, the, the vision is not only to cover the area that station three would cover, but when you insert an extra station and staffing into the overall system, now instead of station one always having to help out station two on those multi-incident calls, now you can have you know, kind of a, a station three, two scenario or a station one, three scenario, which now leaves, uh, uh, you know, a station two, one or three completely available to take that next call. So it's not only, so it's kind of twofold. It's not only about, you know, staffing that station three district, but it's inserting that station and that staffing into this, into the overall system, plugging them in. So now we can handle that without calling for mutual aid on a, on, a, on a more frequent basis and then handling the next call. So, Chief, just to provide a little bit more clarity, so you said three men, usually, or I shouldn't say three men, three officers will, will um, uh, uh, staff a station in total staffing, total employees. What, is, what, is that, what does that mean? Because you don't have one officer coming every single day. So how many officers do we need to staff Oh, so so again, if you do, if you do the math, we have minimum of three. We do a 24, 48-hour shift. So basically, you know, three and three. So we need nine people minimum to to run, you know, minimally run a station. And if we so, have all of these officers, the 39 total, what? How many units will that supply us then, basically? So again, you know, on a, on a quote-unquote good day, because you know, people people have off, they have vacation, they have you know, on occasion they you know, they may get sick, so. But in a perfect world, when you know we would be able to staff, you know, a, a six what we refer to kind of as a six three and three scenario, so that would be the the ultimate. And so we, you know, looking at, you know, staffing the station that has the most call volume within its district, you know, would make the most sense. So, in other words, basically four units. So. If each unit is three, you have six, three, and three, so you have three, and then one station has two units uh, responding. As you know, I'm a strong Pleasant Prairie man. These were questions you asked me and I didn't have answers. Just one other thing. Any $100,000 homes in Pleasant Prairie? Yeah, so the, our, the Miller, we do we do have some hundred thousand dollar homes we do, but in general, what what Miller Communications when they first first started putting this together that was a, a, a piece we typically we do the average median home right is what we typically talk about during tax time. Uh, both the survey and also Miller Communications they said uh, it's easier math people know how to add and so if you say the hundred thousand dollars. And they know that their home is valued at 300. Then they just multiply the 42 by three, right? Or if their home is a half a million, then they can multiply it by five. So, I appreciate the humor, though, Wayne, because <laughs> some of us simple mind people like myself also appreciate it being being the hundred thousand. So, let's let's go this gentleman first, and then I think Mike had a question, and then Tom. All right, and also we need to be cognizant. Are there individuals on line that? are wishing to speak or have a hand up. I just want to make sure that they don't feel ignored. 
Not okay. at this time, but uh, if anybody online would like to make a comment, please uh, raise your virtual hand. It's located at the center of the bottom of the screen. Okay, I have a couple questions, but I'll take a break after I answer. So I have to disagree with you that a fire department only has a one-time cost. Right, you're you're right. There's there's uh, annual uh, maintenance and things of that nature that that take place, and there's there's uh, you know there will be renovations and so right. forth. But in general, the the ability to absorb absorb that is is much simpler. We're talking you know uh, less than a hundred thousand dollars versus a personnel where you're talking a hundred hundred thousand per person. But if we build a new station, how much would it cost to staff it with vehicles as we're taking vehicles from other stations? Right. So, so we are. So, I mean, okay. and, you know, so there's, there's, a, there's already a, a, a vehicle vision, if you will, um, that has been in, in the works for a while. So we already know that when Station 3, you know, if, if and when Station 3 materializes, we're going to move this piece of apparatus. We're going to move the spare ambulance over to Station Three. You know, so we have that vision and that planning. And I, make... and I just want to say, I think it's important to note that these pieces aren't just extra pieces that that you know we we've stocked away for the eventual right, third right, station. Right, right, these right. are pieces that were needed now, um, but it. it Everything has this station three. It really is about if you, you do budgets, you know, there's this step cost, right? Uh, you know, it would be nice in a perfect world. Everything would be an easy, you know, percentage change. and would be this nice gradual uh, increase with fire departments and, and the way we've seen it even with our staffing, right? Um, there was one year where we we hired seven, seven officers. We, we made a big jump. Um, granted, you know, in a perfect world, we'd like a more steady, um, but generally speaking, there are what I'd call step costs, and um, we're not trying to present a rosy picture. We're trying to say this is what this is what we actually need. Uh, we need 14 guys. <laughs> there are 12 guys. Sorry, 12 guys. We need 12 guys and uh, 12 people. Oh, sorry. Thank you. We 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 have we have two. And they're they're awesome. So I apologize again. Hopefully, no one no one took offense. I didn't mean it in any in any degree. So if these twelve firefighters get hired, how long that you need to build a new station? Well, so we can we can we can bring on the staff without a new station, right? So it's kind of we can't have the station without the staff, but we can you know we can bring in and staff the you know the the larger crews with the existing two stations, knowing that. Okay, at station three may be another year out or another year and a half out, you know. So, um, you know, we we can basically staff heavy on the station one and two perspective to get more vehicles and apparatus out. So, your comment earlier about the equipment. So right now we have three ambulances. We don't staff three ambulances. We staff two. If we're staffed, if we have the staffing and we get a third ambulance call, we'll take the third ambulance. That typically doesn't happen. So I'd assume that station would be somewhere out by the interstate or is there already a? There's, so there's some prospective locations, but again, that general area, because again, if you look at, you know, we don't want to block, you know, uh, railroad. We don't want right. to be able to have to traverse railroads. We want clean accesses east, west, north, south, so that we can get to the other parts of the village in addition to covering what that station was intended to. And part of it is the station three, you know, getting to firm or solid answers on station three is kind of premature if you don't have the staffing. Right. One thing I will say is that from a station three um, and the ability to pay, uh, those, those, um, that's, that's, that's much easier from a financial, I, I, can, I, can I make a point before you, this is kind of an important point that I, I did not touch base during the presentation, but the, the state has limited our ability as a municipality how we can fund things. There's, it's pretty restrictive. Um, we're one of the most restrictive states in the nation. Um, I don't mean to complain, but I am. So um, what I'm trying to say, though, is that from a capital standpoint, we have much more flexibility with trying to uh, govern our 
our future and making sure that we don't impact the taxpayers and making sure that we're, we're, we're um, being fiscally responsible and so forth. From a, from a operation standpoint though, you know, we talk about this net new construction, right? Every year, that 2.5% that we're, we're growing, that's based on us that's based on us having new construction here in the village, right? Um, now, what would be assumed is that that new construction will cover, will cover your growth, your step costs, right? The issue is, is that it doesn't account for inflation. I don't know what your pocketbooks did over the last year, but inflation's a big deal. And if our net new construction is just covering inflation, then, then should it be any wonder that we weren't able to keep pace, right, with police and fire along the way so that we didn't come to a point where we needed to come to the, to the taxpayers and ask for additional, additional monies. I would love for that, that, that levy limit restriction to, to um, be at least modified to take into account inflation, but it doesn't currently. Does that make sense? And so where I'm going with that, my point that I'm trying to make is that from uh, uh, Fire Station 3, as staff, we're not coming to the voters for that. We don't need to come to the voters for that. And, and we, we, I think the question that was asked about TID 2, I think that our board members and our staff have been pretty um, wise and judicious in, in how we plan things out so that we don't impact the taxpayer's pocketbook. And I'm not bragging about that because again, like I said, I don't wanna overpromise, under deliver, but the fact is is that um, you've got a very, fiscal, from, a, from a planning standpoint, that's something that this village can be very proud of. That, that transpired prior to me getting here. Um, I've, only been able, I've only had to carry the banner and, but it's been pretty awesome to be able to step into a role like this and be able to say to taxpayers, you've got it good, because we really do. I live here too. We have it good. So anyway. All right. So my next question, and I'll take a break. Um, for the sheriff's department, y'all pay for the sheriff's department. Is there any way you could work a deal that we get one or two dedicated sheriffs? I mean, we're already paying for the service. Yeah, I, and I know this is an easy question looking outside, but no, it's not. It, it's it, I'm I'm not sure the logistics of that. I think if you contract with them, you're paying more. So the the thought of it is this: Summers contracts with the county, and they provide those law enforcement services based on a contract. So even though the county, the Summers residents are already paying taxes, there is a contract there that is over and above that for the contracted law enforcement services. So it's not it's not just, hey, we pay county taxes too, can we have two cops per shift come in? So they, they, it wouldn't be that. It would be more of a formal agreement on a contract with charges up and above what are normally paid for the county taxes. Has the village board gone after them and said, hey, we are, we pay sheriff's taxes, no deal, or is there a way to bring a guy, has that been explored? I'm just asking from outside looking in, like push the issue of we're paying for it. Right. Why are we, why would we have to contract it? We don't want to pay for it. Well, I want to, well, so, I want to make sure that, that I get this absolutely clear is that we have a really good collaborative relationship with with the sheriff's department um, there are times where on the state highways they will do traffic enforcement even within the village because that's their jurisdiction as well on those state highways or the the, the county highways or the bike trail the bike trails well and and we took that bike trail over so the the county said even though that's a county park Village can handle it better than better than we can handle it right now. It's in your jurisdiction. You've got officers right there. It would be more efficient to be able to do that. And I give them a lot of credit for for doing that. We have not formally explored. Hey, what what would it cost to have one or two?
county deputies in our jurisdiction at that time. Because like I said, it, that's going to be over and above what we've got. When our officers are pressing that mic, calling for help, they're getting it from Kenosha PD, Kenosha County, State Patrol, from across the border. Formally, yeah, I, I think that's what you're getting to is that, that formal idea of can they be here all the time. Just so that people online can hear, Mike. Incorporated municipality, if you're over 5,000 people in population, looking for a dedicated first patrol. Possible, but then that'll be that goes to logic. I believe in that actually was is that. That kind of stuff is covered. That's looking like Paddock Lake. Yeah, you know, one. Uh, you know, has the sheriff's department, you know, contracted out. I mean, in in concept, if we were thinking outside the box, okay, everything is something needs to be paid by somebody, right? And so, you know, if we were to state change state statute, and we were to say, hey, you know, instead we want to have a philosophy across the county that they're going to provide manpower. Well, then what would end up happening is it would just be a sh the shift in burden would happen on the county mill rate, right? I mean that's where that's where that's where it would happen uh, because they still have to pay for it. Someone has to pay for, pay for the extra additional manpower. I think he got it, but yeah, no, I, I I think it's a good question to ask, right? No no rock unturned. Mike, what question do you have? And then we have a hand. Tom, I think you had a hand, and then we'll go back over to guess. So I was just gonna. Perfect. Why don't you hand it to Tom? I think Tom had a Patrizzi. <laughs> so I deal with uh, staffing 24-7, 365 myself. The 12 guys is going to be huge. You guys need them. Really puts uh, on our shift. If no, they are, Tom, they're already spread out. Now you got to, it, it, it adds additional personnel into put into patrol. So those oh, I'm saying four is enough. I yeah, mean, four four is enough at this point. I thought we were being very responsible in taking a look at our operation and what we needed to address. And I we've got a responsibility to you being a you won't be being a taxpayer. No. Well, it, 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 that some of those things need to get addressed in the annual budgets. So just like we've seen growth, when I got here, we had 30 officers. Now we have 36 because of responsible, thought-out growth during those years and the participation of the village board on recognizing that to be able to raise those levels up a little bit. We find ourselves at a point now where we are beyond that. So asking for those four personnel is going to get us where we need to get right at this point without overreaching and overstretching it. Um, I, Both departments do a fantastic Thank you. And the Thanks. And I, I just want to add a, a comment because I appreciate your sentiments. And what I hear you saying is, uh, why not ask for more, <laughs> more police? Um, and I appreciate um, uh, Chiefs Montana because uh, one thing that I pride ourselves in from a village standpoint is, uh, you know, we do work together and we try to figure out the best the where where the needs are across across the budget and not putting uh, uh, we're not siloed. 
if you will. Um, other organizations that I've worked for have been very, very siloed, you know, very me mentality when it came to the departments. But one thing that I think is important <laughs> to point out is that a referendum is not the ideal way to ask for, for personnel. And I'll tell you exactly why. Uh, how, how easy, uh, Chief Repke, do you think it's going to be to hire 12, 12 officers in one year? It'll be challenging to say the least. Yeah, yeah. it's going to happen like that, right? Yeah. Um, we would much rather we would much rather be able to have this swallowed over time, right? But unfortunately, the way we're structured doesn't allow for that. Now, if I were to go and ask for more men, you know, we could, but we also don't want to be hoggish to the taxpayers as well. We're grateful that there are some taxpayers who have the sentiment that, no, we think you need more. And that's awesome. We appreciate that support. But there's also only so much that the Python can swallow at any one given time. And so we're, we're going to try to do things as fiscally as responsible, try to address as much as we can during the annual budgets. Um, and, and I think that we've tried to do that, facilitate that as much as possible, even since I've arrived. Um, you know, we've, we've, instead of asking for, for, you know, 14 guys, we're asking for 12 fire medics because we've tried to put those fire medics into the annual budget over the last three years. So well, we've been, we've been creative. It, it, there are a number of law enforcement grants, generally from the federal government that allow you to pick up additional personnel. We were able to do that during a period of time during the Obama administration when they specifically targeted law enforcement agencies for school resource officers. So we were able to write that grant, get that that position fully funded by the federal government for a year and then decrease by 25% each year for four years with the idea that you're going to keep that individual. So that was that was a huge financial help being able to pick that additional person up. Now that person's on our payroll, so the feds aren't paying it anymore, but that was a big pickup in the beginning to address a specific need. And we are constantly looking at those opportunities to be able to take some more of your taxpayer money back from the feds to try to help us out additionally. So that's that's an ongoing process. That's That's part of my job and job of my command staff. And just for, for full clarification, we got that SRO officer through a grant, but then KOSD is on our payroll, but KOSD is paying, Correct. basically reimbursing right. for those funds just in case there was yep. any confusion. So one of the things I'd like to just talk briefly about, you know, mentioned about creativity and, and staffing. So, you know, for the last couple decades, almost three decades now, you know, the fire department has been, quote unquote, creative in, in, in how we staffed. I mean, and it started like any other small department, you know, volunteers paid on call, part time, you know, and, you know, what happened is that we grew, you know, as a, as a village, as a, as a region, uh, we, we grew. And uh, the demographics of who we used to get changed as well. You know, we used to do internships. We used to have live-ins. Um, you know, paid on call and part time, you know, those demographics, at least for this area and for this region, you know, have, have dried up. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, volunteers and part time don't work in other regions of the country, but for this region of the country and for where we are, if you look at between, you know, two large Chicago and Milwaukee cities, um, you know, part time is hard to come by. And then you take and you, you add to that the requirement of training and, and you know, I just can't have a casual, um, you know, person. Uh, I know probably five, six years ago, I had an individual that said, you know, if you're looking for someone to drive the ambulance, I can do it on the afternoons, you know, we can't have that. You know, we just can't have someone say, I want to drive the ambulance. I mean, it may sound cool, but at the end of the day, you know, they need to be trained. They need to understand the operation, laws of traffic, mm -hmm. Um, so it's it's unfortunately it's just it's changed and it's uh, it's changed to where you know full time you know the level of training and liability 
um, has, has, has morphed into a, a full-time job. I think I think I think that's a great point, Craig, uh, Chief Repke. And just to to add some flavor, I think you you could have it. It's just as a as a user of the service, I don't know if I'd necessarily want that, right? And not only that, we have changed. Where where from a volunteer, you know, I I participated in a municipality of you know five thousand uh, five thousand size community, and you know, their call volume was significantly less because they were just responding to fire calls. And so the idea of being a volunteer for a fire department in that scenario was, oh, maybe I have a call a month that I respond to or a call once a quarter. And as a village of Pleasant Prairie, we've outgrown that. And the demand for the time is, is much more significant. Um, where I mean, you'd have to have a massive volunteer volunteer list, which just is is and would again, be for this region. The demographics don't support it, right? You know? and, and, the, and, the, and the change now is that you know, again, I mentioned earlier, we, we fight the clock. You know, whether it's a cardiac arrest, whether it's a stroke, whether it's a fire, the sooner we can get in to mitigate those circumstances, the better the outcome is going to be. You know, you know, if we can get in there and mitigate, you know, a fire and suppress that fire, you know. You're, you're fixing, you know, your repair of your, of your house and your belongings is going to be much smaller than if it takes us, you know, 10 minutes to get there, 10, 12 minutes to get there. You know, fire behavior has changed dramatically over, over the past two decades. You know, everything that we touch now is petroleum-based. And uh, so, again, it's just it's not good, bad, right, wrong. It's just different. And, you know, we, we need to, quote, unquote, attack it differently. If I can just add one more thing, because I think it's important, is that you know you add you you add this change in demographic with staffing. Okay, that was a, a compounder of of a problem that couldn't be addressed with net net new construction, and then on top of it, the inflation, which couldn't be addressed by the net new construction. It it it's not a lack of our professional or our, our staffing or our planning. It's, it's these are the cards we're, we're dealt and trying to work it as best as possible and be fiscally responsible and so forth. So I think, I just, I think it's important to note and hopefully that there's a, a citizen confidence uh, in the village staffing that, that when we bring something, a need, it's sincere. It's not, it's not hey, you know, we just need more money. That's that's not the case. Um, I know there was a question. There was one more question in the audience. You've been waiting so so patiently. Can you ask that again, just the I'm microphone. So sorry. How many officers do you have staffed on first shift? The general uh, command staff is on first shift too. So myself and and two captains. And those captains are broken down into one running the patrol division and one running operations. And then we've got uh, our, our detective bureau and they are on generally on day shift, they can be reassigned to second shift. And then we've got our patrol section. So we try to look at how many calls for service are, are coming in. I think we are staffed at seven personnel on day shift patrol at this point. How many on second shift? Uh, I believe we're at eight. At eight? So day shift and second shift carry predominantly the, the call load, like what you'd see in any other jurisdiction. So we, we, we look at those calls and the breakdown of those calls, which you'll be able to see in our upcoming release of our annual report and how they swing through the day to identify where that staffing needs to be. And I apologize, you may have already answered this, but I didn't hear it. How many resource officers? Have? We have one. Just the one in the entire Just one, right. Thank you. Thank you. And they, they spend, they've got an office at, at Lakeview Tech, and then they travel through the other elementary schools. Thank you. All right, just two more questions for me. Uh, this is for the chief. How many percentage which, of calls? Which one? Oh, please, which sorry. One? <laughs> okay. um, how many percentage of calls are out at the outlet mall? Is that like a predominant pull on your service? Uh, I don't want to say predominant. I, I, we've got, we spend a lot of time at residential calls. That's, so while we may respond to a lot of calls for service, 
out at the businesses, the majority of our time is spent on when we go to a residential call, it takes more time because okay, you're, just... you're actually dealing with people. Right. Um, I, I think that there was, it, it kind of goes in, in spurts. Seasons. Sure. Yeah. You know, so the, the holiday season coming up, depending on how, how vigilant the stores are being out there and how often they are calling us, we don't have an officer staffed out there. So we're not, we're not doing that at this point, right. but between the other retail uh, centers and the outlet mall, we've got a West squad and a West business squad when, when times get hot. I'm asking this because if looked and see if that's a big draw to like maybe say to the outlet mall, are you guys going to need to hire a security guard or angling way to charge for make? Yeah. To, yeah. Because if that's pulling on our services right, and we're paying for them, that's Correct, but the the outlet mall and those businesses also pay those taxes. Well, I, I so, understand they I, they pay taxes, but right, they're not citizens. And they do, and they do have security. <laughs> They've got security staffed um, throughout the day, except for a, a, a couple hours, and um, we've got camera systems up in place that we can monitor those from our dispatch center as well. Um, we have never looked at, okay, we're going to put on a special surcharge for that for that business. Because I'm just asking for like percentage wise, because I I can't give you an exact percentage. Right, I'm not looking for, for it, but I'm just has that ever been explored? Right. So, and my next question, last one: How long will this increase tax levy cover the next population growth? With have it planned out. This will cover us for the next 20, 30, 15. Years, especially with Village Green, the closing that old. Right. Um, my view on that is the 40 officers is enough to get us staffed through the next several years. I, I think looking into the future, I think we look at the calls for service, we see the areas of, of projected growth in the village, and I think that's that's where I wanted to get, not just like right now, but a couple of years ago, I was looking to get to 40 because I think that answers part of our concern. Now, I, I think that we need to stay on top of it as we grow. And if the needs, if the future needs of the village, if we look at that and say, okay, we're gonna need an additional officer in, in two years, let's start planning for that then that's how we stay on top of that. Yep. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a finite process, like, right. okay, now we've done this and we're done for good now. No, I you know. that, but I don't right. know if you guys it, I, Right, I, I, think, I, think the, I think if you look historically throughout, um, municipalities like our village, um, if you look at what they expected growth to be throughout the years, and then you saw uh, critical times like 2008 come into play, where it just really, really put a dent in that, that's what kind of takes the, the, the power out of making those estimates. I, I think one thing that also kind of answers this question, but in a different way is, you know, how long have we been studying this you know, we started this in 2018. Uh, four years later, we're bringing it to you as well educated, as well planned out, as well thought out as we possibly could. We took our time, and I think that you're going to continue to see that same. Um, that that's a, a a value set or a, a philosophy that has been exhibited by the village for a very long time. I think it will continue. Um, at least as long as as long as I'm here, and we so. don't <laughs> and we don't want to come back with referendum after referendum after oh, referendum. Heck you no. know, I, I, <laughs> we we've got we would much rather do uh, smaller planned out growth, which is going to have to happen. Right. You know, if the if the village grows significantly over the next three or four years, we're going to need to add some additional personnel in in both our public safety. Um, to be able to take care of that. 
But over the last decade, we've gone up 16% in population, right? right? Um, and so... Yeah, we've got a caller online, too. Um, your, your comment that, you know, we don't want to keep bringing up referendum right. after referendum for this. This brings up a, a thought, and it ties back to Nathan's comment. I think it's Nathan, right? Correct? It ties back to your comment about inflation. I'm sure we've all been to the gas station, the grocery store. You tried to buy a car lately. You know that things are rough out there. I mean, it's 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 out of control. Right. And I'm just worried that this may not be the best time to bring this referendum up. And with that fact in mind, if it shouldn't pass this time, um, is it dead until the next election cycle, or can it be brought back in a separate village referendum? Yeah, great, great question. So, and one first year, first question of is is this the right time? Um, I don't know if there's ever a right time. <laughs> let's, let's, well, well, but, but, but now, now especially, I mean, in view but, of the pandemic and everything else that's going on now, yeah. it just doesn't stop. So, so the one thing that I would say is that um, with TID2, I, I think it's a very optimal time. Um, from a, a village standpoint. Now, I, again, we're not publicizing that. We're not making a big deal because we don't want to necessarily, again, overpromise, underdeliver. Um, so, if it fails, which it could, um, uh, uh, there's, uh, it, it's, it's going to cause the village board and staff to go back to the drawing board and to, to really think about it. Like, what do we want to do? What do we want to do next? The one positive thing is, is that next year, then we would have um, we would have the TID2 impact. We'd know exactly what it is, and then we might be able to make a, another educated argument and, and maybe try to convince, um, you know, that 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 voter population that just wasn't convinced previously. Having said that, I think from where the the village felt satisfied that from a, a survey standpoint. You know that was a good. It was a good, um, a good spread of of the demographic. Um, it was positive. I, there there is support, um, and um, so that's been positive. That's been reassuring. When I when I uh, hear some individuals say, "Hey, you know, are you sure you have enough?" That's also positive, right? Um, so I'm going into this thinking that you know uh, with a positive outlook. Uh, clearly, we can't guarantee anything. We can't, um, but I also can't guarantee you that next year there isn't going to be another something that came up. You know, COVID-19 happened the previous two years, and you have, you know, COVID-22, uh, or or you have a, a really volatile a really volatile election, or maybe there's, you know, who who knows. Um, and it just came to a point where, as staff, we've studied this out. We've given the 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 best. We've we've tried to document this as best as possible to provide uh, an educated uh, public a, an educated um, opportunity to to make an informed decision. Um, anyway, but just to summarize, what I'm, what I'm hearing from this then is that. This, this referendum uh, is indeed tied to an election cycle, correct? No, we could, is, that's, that's a great question. Could we do, it is tied to an election. We can't just have a referendum for a referendum stake, but we can do in a special election, if there is some other election, we could put the referendum on the ballot. Um, so for instance, in the fall, if there's an election, we could do it in the fall. Um, if there's a primary, we would just have to, we would have to pass a, a resolution saying that we're putting it on the ballot. Um, we chose this one because the timing, um, uh, the timing we finished the survey, we, we wanted to go through the proper process. And so we got the assessment done, then we did the survey. Once we got the survey, we were able to meet with the, the village board. We reviewed it. We wanted to make sure that we went through a, a certain process. So, um, yeah. One hope, last question, if I may. I the the, well. the increase, uh, the percentage going from 2.5 or whatever it was up to 10%. Now, that is in addition to our normal tax increases that we see every year? No, the 2% represent or is that grand total. Yes, yeah, so that's grand total. So, the okay. 2% represent the 2. Point, I forget what point percentage it was. 
that's what we would normally anticipate in the year with net new construction. And so with the addition of the 1.6, it's going, and that 10% is based on what the, the total growth of, of what's being levied. That doesn't necessarily mean how much your tax bill increased, right? Sure. Um, because, uh, you know, your house value might be less than, if we were to go to premium, out, premium outlet, they're, they're the largest taxpayer in the village, you know? Um, so anyway. There's a question online. They've been waiting patiently. Yeah, I do have one online here. I am going to um, allow them to talk. Hi, I was just wondering, uh, how many senior care facilities are there, nursing homes or senior whatever kind of places are there? And how many beds does that take up and how much of your... Uh, how much of well, how much time or rescue calls has that taken up for for fire? So I don't have the exact number as far as as far as percentages, but I can tell you we we look at the data because we do have you know we we do have you know senior care facilities, uh, you know senior living facilities, and sometimes the perception is oh you're always going to those locations. So we want to make sure we look at the data. And, and so far, the data still shakes out that one in two family residences are our, our primary call destinations. Uh, same goes along the line for like uh, businesses. You know, you know so, uh, we have, we've had questions about, you know, well, you know, how many times you go to the different businesses. And, and in actuality, uh, the data, you know, represents is that, you know, we don't go to the businesses you know, as often as one might think. It still comes down to one in two family residences are our primary, you know, call destinations, if you will. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Or uh, is Pleasant Prairie building more? Question. I'm sorry, once again. Is Pleasant Prairie planning on building more or are you figuring that into your numbers too? Yeah, I don't, uh, as far as, you know, additional um, senior care facilities or living, you know, I mean. We don't have any on the books right now as far as development. Um, the, you know, as, as we grow, um, you know, senior care and, and senior housing is, is uh, an important piece of the fabric um, of what makes a community. You know, uh, I, I wish that you know, uh, from a, a taxpayer standpoint, you know, uh, schools don't pay taxes, right? Or churches don't pay taxes, but, but you need churches and schools in, in your community to make it, make it a community. Um, right now, I think in total with senior housing, that was our senior, senior care facilities, I think we've got four or five. I'm just doing the math yeah, in my you head. Know, and, the, and the challenge depends is that, you know, there are certain <laughs> facilities that there's certain facilities that, you know, house a lot of seniors, but their defined occupancy is basically an apartment complex. Right. You know, so, you know, you have, you know, you could have like, for instance, the Addison as an example, you know, they have a memory Ooh, care unit, awful, so. but they also have an apartment. Okay. That apartment complex is a, the occupancy type is not a senior care facility. So, you know, it, it kind of based, you know, and then when we, as we pull our data, you know, we look at those occupancy types, you know, is it a, a CBRF, you know, a community-based residential facility, you know, is it a, a memory care, is it a nursing home? You know, we have really technically, and, and I, I think, I don't know exact numbers, I, we only have two or three defined nursing homes in the jurisdiction, you know, because by occupancy type. So, um, so it's a little bit it's a little bit fuzzy, you know, as far as those locations, you know. So we don't really call uh, just because an apartment complex has a lot of seniors living there. It's still just an apartment complex. That makes sense. What, one thing that I would add, though, Chief, to the question, what I think uh, I I don't know the name of the caller. What, what was your name? Arlene. <laughs> oh, was that Arlene? Arlene. Um, so, 
to your question, though, I think that, that this is important because we did spend, to, to the chagrin of, of the chief, this is something that uh, his administrator, Nathan, me, uh, made him go through the exercise quite, quite rigorously, was looking at where our call volume is going towards and whether there were ways to reevaluate uh, how, we, how we provide service, kind of to the question that was alluded to earlier with regard to, you know, should premium outlet be required to provide a different type of security model and, and um, are we supplementing services to them? Uh, this was a question that, that I had and, and uh, that I wanted to make sure we had well vetted. And to, to what Chief is saying, I just want to emphasize this, that the call volumes we saw uh, the trend was really this this increase to the 83 percent of call volumes the most significant is really in our residential home single homes that's where the bulk of the increase has happened and i can explain why even or this is my assumption or my best guess is our demographics, we are an aging population. Um, we see that growing. So there is a, there, I, I don't anticipate that call volumes in residential homes is going to decrease. Um, that really is the bulk. When we look at from a fire and rescue, their call volume really concentrates on the residential side. Um, from a PD, um, you know, if we're looking just purely at calls for service, it, it translates more to the commercial, but a lot of their time is concentrated in the residential because those calls require a, a more time. Yeah, just as an example, I mean, uh, you know, we, I never would have thought we would have done this in, in the 39 years I've been doing this, but, you know, because of the d demographic changes, we go to what we refer to as a patient assist. Okay, um, so somebody just needs some help, whether, and, and usually it's, it's folks in, that are older, not always, but, you know, they, and their spouses aren't able to help them. And so they call 911 and, uh, you know, we don't, you know, we don't, you know, try to figure out, you know, well, is that really an emergency or do we, you know, do we go not go? We, we show up. And uh, we may not transport to the hospital. Um, there's times that we do, you know, that it turns into a more, you know, significant call. But, you know, we are going to people's residents to help them, you know, either get up or because they have some, you know, deficiency that they, they need some help with. And, you know, we never used to do that 20 years ago. Well, the demographics have changed somewhat, too, in the sense that, you know, sons and daughters now live across the country. Absolutely. Right. It, it, it isn't the same family dynamic that we had 20 years ago. It really has shifted and it's changed. And that shifted the, the type of calls that we're responding to. And again, it goes back to even some of the points that we made on the PD that we don't necessarily have an option to say, I'm not going to respond to that call or I don't want to I don't want to put process that evidence. Um, because it's just going to take more time. <laughs> and um, I will tell you that, you know, for instance, for, for some of those patient assist calls, if it becomes repetitive in a certain time frame, you know, there, there is a charge for that, you know. And again, you know, it's not because we want to charge people, but it's because, you know, you know, if we go to, you know, the same residence, you know, four times in a month, you know, we also try to look at, you know, are there other services? You know, can we get the county involved? Can we get county health involved? Because there might be some other repetitive things that are going on that maybe we can get them, you know, a different level of help. So it, again, is, is a change in demographics that, you know, we never had to deal with before, you know, 20 years ago. Other questions? And if there are none, it's almost eight o'clock and I feel bad that you've had to listen to us for this long, but we really do appreciate the, the informative and the well thought out questions and, and hope that this has been a good evening. Wayne, just wait just a second. Let's get a, a why don't you say that on the microphone so that the people <laughs> in the audience can hear that. I just want to thank the three of you for being so transparent with the audience.
Well, we appreciate that, Wayne. And and again, I want to just thank thank the audience for uh, you know. In a lot of ways, you know, we hope hope that there aren't questions. We hope that we just hope that everybody just expects and says, "Hey, you're doing a good job." But when people do come out and they care, that we want an engaged community. We want you to ask questions. We want you to feel like you can trust us, and and that you have confidence, and also that you you're, you're proud of of this community. And so yeah. we thank you for demonstrating that pride in coming out tonight. And on a, one real final note, at least from my perspective, you know, we want people to ask questions. We want, you know, we want you to challenge us because, you know, we, first off, we, we, we love what we do. We want to do the best job possible. And the people that we have working, you know, in those respective disciplines, you know, love what they do. They're, they're trained people. The village gives us great equipment to work with, and that gives us the opportunity to, to, to basically make, you know, bad things better. So we thank like, you. We like those questions, and, and your, we appreciate the fact that you joined us tonight um, because we know that the information that you hear is going to help you to an educated vote, and that's all we ask. That's what we're, that's what we're looking for is just an educated vote. Places. Not too many places in the state. You are going to see a police chief and a fire chief together. In this community, that happened for years. It doesn't happen in other communities. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Steve, I can echo that. That is a, that is a valid comment. Thank you, everyone. This concludes our public information meeting. I believe that it will be visible online. Um, so if there are individuals that missed it,